Come here and pray for the pastor so I can preach well. Amen. Lord, as a pastor Jerry and have a good church, have your church, so to help out of Pastor Carr, so you say amen. 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 Thank you, Parker. You know, the, the longer you live, you'll hear people say this phrase when you uh, when they do things. And I've heard it. I've heard it from my kids who I raised. I've heard it from people I've been around a while. And every now and then I've said it to other people who were. Uh, the, the statement's pretty simple. You don't know me. Have you ever said that to somebody? You don't know me. You think you know me, but you don't know me. And you don't won't know me until you get put in a place with me. Uh, you've gone through pressures with me. Many of you, such as uh, Pastor Joseph, have been through the floods with me. You, you'll get to see how people are. Uh, you know, I take uh, scooter rides, and I mean long rides on my bike. You don't know somebody till you've been seven, 800 miles in a day on a motorcycle in heat. Then you get to know them a little better. When you go through life's struggles, that's when you get to know them. Right now, we're kind of on the peripheral, even in the church world. So I'm always asking people, I want to hear your story. I want to know you. Uh, I also want to mention that I think it's going to be a week from Saturday. We're going to be doing uh, Sister Carol Massey's uh, a Celebration of Life. Carol said right here. Amen by Ms. Linda, and uh, she went on to be with Jesus this week, and uh, we went over, uh, Pastor Joseph and I visited with her uh, a couple weeks ago with Bob and Rhea, and so it's Bob Jones and Rhea's, uh, it's Rhea's mother-in-law, Bob's mom, uh, she's a long time part of this house, amen, so we'll be having that celebration of life a week from Saturday, uh, not this Saturday, not this coming Saturday, but two weeks, so it'll be two weeks away, uh, yeah, on the 11th, thank you. So just want to mention that. But getting back to you don't know me, last week I preached a, a thought on Jesus, the original outlaw. And there were people that I could see in their faces that they, they could not relate a religious Jesus uh, that sat on their dash on the cross, you know, with a, uh, an outlaw. And they struggled with that thought, and I tried to bring that out. So I kept reading through the book of Mark and started picking up on some things. And listen, when we don't strive to get to know people, we misunderstand their intentions. We don't know why they do what they did or why they do what they do. And again, to some extent, even starting the little country church over 20 years ago, started some uh, misconceptions, if you'd say, among some people. And, uh, you know, I have a passion for winning souls. I, I'm, I'm a pastor. Uh, you know, I, you know, I always talk about the fivefold ministry. There's apostles, there's, there's prophets, there's evangelists, there's pastors, and there's teachers. That's the fivefold ministry, and I, I work in the office of the apostolic apostle, being able to start churches, been able to do that for over thirty years now. Start, the, I can get something started. The issue is keeping it going. You know, anybody can start something. Anybody can get it. You know, it's one thing to get a child into the nursery. It's another thing to raise them until you can kick them out of the house. Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. So that, that's uh, starting is one thing. Starting is the fun part. But, but the longevity. Now, after 20 years of little country church and moving through this time, you know, I realized that moving this thing forward and keeping it going, having vision for the house is such a powerful thing. But I have a passion as an evangelist. I have a heart for winning. I want people to Jesus with a shotgun between my lap as a, uh, a security guard when I worked in San Antonio when I was in college. I've won people on the streets in San Antonio. I've, I've done, uh, I've enjoyed, you know, if I could get you up in a plane with a parachute on your back, I promise you I can win you to Jesus. I was on a plane a little while back, and it started bucking and jerking like a good, like a good horse, like a, not, not, like, not like a good horse, like a sour horse. And everybody on the plane started screaming. They were hollering, and the little things were falling down, and everybody's bucking. I was going, I was going, come on, Jesus. Hey, man, take me now. You know, they, they're like, <laughs> everybody won't be your friend at that time. Hey, man, so not, being, not walking into that kind of fear is, is a powerful feeling in your life. And I know this church has been misunderstood with our diversity and integration of bikers and cowboys and gearheads and misfits. But here's what you need to understand. You've got to keep this fun. If you don't, you're in trouble. Over 1,300 pastors resign every month. 
because they quit, this quits being fun to them. They, they, they find a burden to it. Nearly 30% of ministers have resigned at least once in a decade. 40% of today's pastors are going to be in another line of work. 70% say they have no close friends. And we've all been there. And when we refuse to get to know somebody, we begin to misunderstand their intentions. You know, and it happens like this. There can be an innocent act or a word or implication that's poorly interpreted. An offense is created as a result. You know, we don't grow fully and completely without sometimes being misunderstood, we're going to offend. It's going to happen. That's why a lot of people stay home. It's easier to stay home and not be offended than to come here and be offended. Let me tell you real fast about offenses. I've walked in offense and I have been offended. But here's what I found out in life. There are times, Kenny, where somebody is holding on literally to life and none of that matters anymore. And this happened in my life over the last few months where friends of mine who we've had some disagreements have come close to near death, and all of a sudden, none of that mattered anymore. What seemed like a big thing became a real small thing. Amen. And what mattered was relationship. Can I get an amen? Those type of connections. And as I walked through it, I realized Joseph, when you look in the, in the Old Testament, his confrontation with his brothers over a coat of many colors, a coat of favor, if you would. Uh, you know, he had a dream, and they didn't understand it. He, he was sold as a slave to Potiphar, oversaw his home. He ran, he ran from his wife. He left his coat. He spent the next two years at an all-male camp called prison, all because of an act poorly interpreted. David had a confrontation, King David, before he was king as a young teenager. He had a confrontation with King Saul. He killed a Goliath. He soothed Saul with a harp. Saul heard people sing David's praises. He exaggerated his intention. First Samuel 18, 8 says, Saul, King Saul was very angry. This is after Goliath is dead. Uh, this refrain galled him. The people were singing. They credited David with tens of thousands. They were literally singing singing that David had killed tens of thousands, and he thought, but me with only thousands, what more can he get out of the kingdom? I often relate it to today when somebody got a thousand likes on Facebook and you got 10,000, and all of a sudden they hate you because you got more likes than they did. Huh? Because it affects us. Social media affects us. Saul, he didn't know him. Everybody say he didn't know him. I'm going to say it again, didn't know him. Saul chased David for 12 years. We don't realize 12 years. He went from king's confidant and warrior to social outcast and most wanted. Some of those misunderstandings may last from a day, a week, 12 years. Some may be even like Jesus for last time. And I'll tell you this. As I walked through the life of Christ last week, I realized people don't know Jesus. They just don't know the Jesus of the Bible. Amen. Jesus, his critics joked about his birth being illegitimate. They disputed his heavenly origin. Some said he was a devil and had a devil. They scorned his purpose, condemned his teaching, and at the end they called him a criminal and they crucified him. Amen. John chapter 1 verse 5 says the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. They didn't know him. They didn't pick up on him. Now listen, when I walk through it again in Mark chapter 3, I see it over and over. He wasn't known by his people. The Pharisees didn't know him. The religious leaders didn't know him. Amen. Even his own family did not know him. In the book of Mark chapter 3 verse 1 says, Another time he went into the synagogue, a church, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. This tickles me. You can heal on Tuesday. You can heal on Thursday. You can heal on any day that starts with a T except on Sunday or Saturday. But don't do it on the Sabbath because on the Sabbath, that's our religious day. We don't allow healing on Sabbath. <laughs> Again, listen, I don't care what day it is. If I can get healed on it, I want healed on it. I want to get well. If a miracle can come on, on Monday, I want it on Monday. Can I get an amen? amen? So they were watching him, and Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. A little bit of an embarrassing moment. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they remained quiet. He looked around at them in anger. Who, if Jesus gets mad, you in trouble. Deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And say, see, some people think stubbornness is a spiritual gift. Stubbornness is the sin of witchcraft. To be stubborn, stiff-necked, to not allow God to flow in your life. And here he's stubborn. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched out that right hand, and his hand was completely restored. 
When the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians, now understand, Herodians didn't believe in life after death. Pharisees did. So here are two groups that shouldn't even get along. It's like Church of Christ and Pentecostals. They got together and decided, you know what we need to do? We need to kill Jesus. We need to take him out. So they joined together. They became strange bedfellows, if you would. But that healing of that hand, I have often was, were amazed at it. The ministry of Jesus, again, was one of restoration. He restores my soul. He had that right hand. Your right hand is a hand of blessing. When you shake hands, and Johnston, I noticed you were left-handed. I know it was a, uh, a disability. <laughs> he picked up one of my guns, and he couldn't even hold it right, Tommy. He, he was looking out of the wrong side of it. Uh, but, uh, but that right hand, when you shake hands, it's almost always the right hand. The hand of, of being able to bless. It's the hand of ministry. When you lay hands on people, it's the right hand. According to the Word of God, it's the hand of power. Jesus said, hand, sits on the right hand of the throne of God. It's the hand of receiving. When you receive, it's with this hand. It's the hand of fellowship. So for him to have a withered hand, to be in church, to, to not be able to be blessed, to not be able to receive, not to be able to, to reach out, was a horrible thing. And when Jesus saw him, he said, sir, stand up. And when he stood up, he said, stretch out that hand. And this is what I would tell you. Everybody stretch your right hand forward. Amen. I pray God bless your right hand. Use it for ministry, receiving, and blessing to be used of God. It's so important, man, to be able to use it. And Jesus saw him. Stand on up. And then they began to get up. They didn't know him. They didn't understand him. But Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost and to heal that which needed healing. That's why he came. Amen. So what would cause a withered hand? Well, there's a lot of things. A compromise, a neglect of use, a crushing wound to be offended. I meet people that, that used to reach out, connect, and all of a sudden they got offended, and now they've drawled up. Matter of fact, very seldom, they're not in church today. Most of the time they stay away from church. Because a hand has been crushed. Something offended them. Something bothered them. The preacher didn't shake their hand. Uh, maybe, maybe Pastor Joseph didn't invite them to do something. Uh, maybe they weren't uh, connected to a group. But something hurt their feelings. And when their feelings got hurt, they withdrew their hand. You know, my prayer is that God will reach through this uh, program here, however, maybe even into your life, and heal their right hand. So they, they can connect again. Church can be a horrible place. It can be a place of uh, segregation, cliques. There's always cliques in church. Jesus had a clique. They were known as the 12 disciples. Everybody got cliques. But when your clique disassociates another clique, it's called sin. So make sure you can click with other clickers. Can I get an Amen. That's in the Bible. I, I found it in 2 Jerry chapter 4. <laughs> the heart of the Pharisees, look what it said. It, they, they, their heart was full of hatred. Uh, it eclipsed their understanding. Hate will take away your understanding. I'm watching our nation, the divided nation of America. We're not the United States of America. We're divided states of America. And hate has eclipsed. People are thinking the stupidest things. Back home, we'd say idiots. But hate literally has eclipsed their understanding. They don't want to understand. They don't even, it's not even an argument to have. With. They don't want to hear your side. They don't want to know your Jesus. And so hatred began to eclipse their understanding, and they sought for a way to kill him. He was not known by his own people. They didn't know him. Amen. You don't know me. That's what Jesus could have said. Mark chapter 3, we'll just keep moving on down. Verse 20, that Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so much that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, who's his family, his brothers, his sister, and, and uh, his mother, when they heard about this, they went to take charge of Jesus, for they said he is out of his mind. He's 33 years old, and his mama wants to take charge of him. Amen. Go out and tell him how he's going to run his life, what he's going to do for his ministry. Amen. A large crowd gathered, which usually means there was no time to eat. Last week, I didn't eat till after Muscle Car Sunday till later on that night. It happens every time we have a big event. I know what Jesus meant when he said, I have food you know not of. 
Because there's something about connecting with people that's far greater than just eating. I just want to be with them. I just want to hang out with them. I want to see how they do it. And Jesus understood that. And all of a sudden, his family went out, and they heard. And it says right here, verse 21, when his family heard about this, when they heard about what? What was it they heard about? That Jesus had quit his day job as a carpenter and got 12 men following after him? On top of that, one is a tax collector. Some are Roman haters. Uh, one has a reputation as a thief, and the rest are smelly fishermen. This is what's hanging out with my boy. We're all concerned about who, who hangs out with our kids. Amen. Is this who's hanging out with my boy? You know, he, he, he's done made the Pharisees fighting mad. You can't do that with religion. Hey, and look how skinny he's got. I mean, he's, got he's gotten real thin because he won't eat because of all the people pressing around him. So they went to take charge over him. They didn't know him. They didn't understand his calling and why he was here. Amen. He's out of his mind. Amen. Now the hometown crowd has mistaken his passion for the lost as insanity. Amen. They didn't understand he came to seek and to save the lost. What's next? Not known by the professors of the law. They actually sent an email up to the headquarters in Jerusalem and said, there's this guy walking on water. Healing lepers. Uh, he, he took a man who, who was dropped through a roof and told him to take up his bed and walk. And just lately, he had a guy with a, with, a, with a messed up right arm and told him to stretch it forth. And now the man is healed. So verse 22, chapter 3 says, And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, Let me say this to you. Teachers of the law. Do you have any idea how many teachers in Christian colleges who have no relationship with Jesus? All of our colleges on the East Coast were started as Christian colleges, and most of those professors don't know Jesus. They ain't got no idea who he is. They teach the Bible. They can teach history, but they have no relationship with him. They don't know him. Amen. They've never met him. The same with these guys. These teachers who came down from Jerusalem said he's possessed by Beelzebub. You know who Beelzebub is? Let me tell you who Beelzebub, Beelzebub is. Beelzebub is another name for Satan. Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies. Lord of the Flies. Not just any fly. I bought my wife a, uh, a gun for Christmas. It's her favorite gun. It shoots salt. Mm-hmm. You cock that thing, and you see a fly, and you shoot that fly with it. Oh, she ain't, she's forgotten all the diamond rings, <laughs> all the vehicles I bought her. She's forgotten all, all the nice clothes and watches. The only thing she remembers that's been the greatest gift, sir, do yourself a favor. Buy your wife a gun. Get her one of them salt guns. Because ain't nothing like shooting, sneaking up on a fly and shooting that thing with salt and watching it tumble and die. Some, something uh, morbid about it. Beelzebub is them great big green flies that fly over cow dungs. You know what I'm talking about? Big green ugly flies eating feces. That's them green flies. So when the Bible calls Satan Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies. I love that name for him. I think it's a great name. He just hangs out with the dung. He's possessed by Beelzebub, they said, by the prince of demons. He's driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. So dispatched from the national headquarters, they're upset. They said he's possessed of the devil, and Jesus couldn't stop the Pharisees from plotting or his old friends from calling him crazy. But let an official preacher, and this is how, you can say a lot of things about me, and I probably won't say a word, but let a preacher say something. I'm going to say something privately to them, but I'm going to go to them, and I'm going to say something. Amen. I've had to deal with this before. See, you know why? Because you don't know me. You don't know me. You heard some stuff, but you don't know me. You know some things I've gone through, but you don't know me. Amen. I, I went and prayed for a woman once in the hospital who was, not, uh, who was not doing well, and, and uh, she had heard some things about me. When I went up there, she looked at me, and she said, Pastor Jerry, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I came to pray for you. And she said, you serious? I said, yeah. 
I said, I thought I'd pray for you before I go to hell. <laughs> Did you know she accepted my prayers? <laughs> Do you know the issue is she didn't know me. She just heard stuff about me. Oftentimes, we don't know people, and they didn't know who Jesus was. Amen. Listen, I'm going to win as many people as possible before I go wherever I go. My prayer and my faith tells me I'm going to go be with him in the kingdom. Amen. I, I don't care what you think. I love him. He wasn't known by his own family. When I got saved, my family didn't know me. It was like, here's why. Watch this. Because I got born again. When you get born again, they don't recognize the new. And all of a sudden, the new is not getting drunk no more. The new ain't smoking weed no more. The new ain't cussing as much as they once did. Takes a little while to get rid of all that, don't it, Charlie? Uh, it, it, uh, it, when you get born again, people don't recognize you. Amen. They, they don't understand why you go to church, why you got people you call brother and sister. Amen. As a matter of fact, I'm your mama, hit your brother, that your sister. That's when you, but no, no, no. Now I got all these brothers and sisters. Amen. You calling her sister? You used to date her. That's weird. I know. I know it is. But, but now we brother and sister. Verse 31 says, And Jesus' mother and brothers arrived standing outside. They sent someone to call him in. They, they sent somebody after Jesus. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Shh, hey, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Jesus said, who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother, my sister, and my mother. See, some believe, come on up, Jojo, amen, some believe the reason Jesus' family stood outside and called for him was because they were convinced he had lost his mind. He's gone crazy. I don't know him. Come home with us, Jesus, and, he, he, you know, we'll try to get your old job back if you'll come with us. And Jesus used this moment as an opportunity to assert his kinship with all who do the will of God. He said this. Who are my mother and my brothers? Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and brothers. He used this moment to connect people. I've often said, and you know it's been true, that blood is thicker than water. But spirit is thicker than blood. Oh, I said blood is thicker than water. But spirit is thicker than blood. When I got born again, I got a new family, and I love my mom. I love my brother. I'm, I'm going home next Sunday after church. I'm, taking a, I'm going to get on my Harley and go to Alabama and visit with them. Amen. My mom, I just need to see my mama. I need just a little. I can't wait till the holidays uh, as she gets older, and so it's important to go. But when I got born again, this became my family. Amen. Johnson, come on up here. I don't know where JoJo's hiding. You can do this, can't you? Okay. Just checking. I put people on the spot at times and never know. But watch. Who are my brothers and my sisters? Listen, if you're in this house and you're born again and you love Jesus, the one next to you is your brother and your sister. And it's not wrong to say that you married your sister. That's Arkansas. <laughs> stay, stay with me. When people don't understand you, ask some questions. Ask who? Who? Consider the source. Try to see through their eyes. You've heard the old phrase, uh, walk in their shoes. Man, I've had to do that at times. I've had to back off and say, man, why'd you say that, Jerry? And even if it's a young lady, What's her shoes like? And security issues and, and life, you know. So you got you got to get into a place. Ask why. Examine the reasons. Is it something I'm doing without realizing it? Is it a blind spot? One of the best things I could do as an investment, whenever my wife gets a vehicle, is put blind spot mirrors on it for her. I have them also on my vehicle. 
because and now I even got a light that a flash amen it's a, it's, it has saved them several times amen when that light, and every now and then you need somebody in your life to flash a light for you and say I don't think you're seeing this you're not seeing it proper so you got to ask yourself that ask what what lessons have I learned how can I, I profit did I learn something about myself what needs changing listen when I graduated from Bible college I, I got a letter from a man and I've mentioned this to you before and he and this was his prayer you know sometimes you get a, a cross pen I know you're fixing to graduate and you're fixing to graduate next week and walk across it well, when I graduate I got a cross pen now when you graduate you get a, you might get a Mont Blanc pen you didn't even know I knew that word uh, it, it's French for fancy ink pen uh, the other side is this I got a card that said this May God give you sermons beaten out of the anvil of experience. The last thing I wanted was sermons beaten out of the anvil of experience. Underneath that, they wrote, May every adverse circumstance yield to you a good result. May every adverse circumstance, yeah, you ought to write it down. May every adverse circumstance yield to you a good result. In other words, Romans 8, 28 all things work to good for those that love God and called according to His purpose. May every adverse circumstance that you go through in life give you a good result. And when you don't know, when people don't know you, and you've been put in certain situations, may everything that goes down in David's life, adverse circumstances yielded him a good result. In Joseph's life, adverse circumstances yielded him a good result. May every adverse circumstance you go through in life yield a good result in your life. Amen. As a friend of mine, Pastor Rick, would say, if it ain't God sent, it's God used. Amen. God didn't send it. He can show enough use. Can I get an amen? Amen. When you give the situation over to God and say, God, I'm defenseless. They don't know me. They just said things about me. They, they, did, they don't know. We, you feel defenseless. I, I'm right, but they'll never believe me. You take over, God. He will perform the most incredible feats as he glorifies his name in your life. Amen. And we grow through this. David said in Psalm 140, and I begin to close here, Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Protect me from the men of violence who plan to trip my feet. Proud men have hidden a snare for me. They have spread out the cords of their net and have set a trap for me along my path. Selah. Which means pause and think about it. O oh Lord, I say to you, you are my God. Hear, O oh Lord, my cry for mercy. O oh sovereign Lord, my strong deliverer, who shields my head in the day of battle. Now, I started finishing the sermon up on Wednesday, Thursday. By yesterday, it hit me. God, I want to know you. I just want to know you. And then I thought what Paul the Apostle went through. The beatings on his back, on the bottoms of his feet, the shipwreck, the snake bite. And I remember in the book of Philippians that Paul wrote these powerful words. Chapter 3, verse 8. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I've lost and I've gained. I've lost and I've gained. And when I read, when Paul writes these words, I started feeling real insignificant. And I said to myself, God, 40 years I've followed you. 40 years I've served you. I've served you through floods. I've, I've served you through difficulties. I've served you through the loss of family and friends. I've served you. And yet I don't feel like I know you. I'm just learning to know you. I'm just picking up things about you. And Paul said, the go back, go back, back, back. I lost because the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Whenever you get to a place in your life where you consider what you've got is garbage, is rubbish, what really matters in life is knowing him. Then Paul walks on and says, and he said, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. If you want to be righteous, hang out with the law. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And then verse 10, I want to know Christ. 
Yes, I, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And you may not ever be like Paul the Apostle, and maybe I'll never be like Paul the Apostle, but those two things right there are the things that help me get to know him. First, the, the power of his resurrection. The scripture said, it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. Amen. If the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that resurrected him, dwell in you, it'll quicken your mortal body. When you know that moment, then you start knowing Christ. When your body's been quickened, when you get up in the morning and say, I don't think I can make another day. God, why? Why should I deal with life? It just keeps throwing stuff on me and on me. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God quickens your body and you feel a resurrection power. You've got purpose to press through on Monday and a Tuesday and move through the week. And people are cheering you on. You don't even know it. They may not know you yet, but the power of the resurrection of Christ will change your life. And then let's talk about his sufferings. When you lose stuff, when you lose friends, when you lose family, and you endure it, and you keep, you understand how many friends Paul lost as he moved through his own life? And I stand on the, on the precipice of understanding that I may lose. I called a pastor this morning I ain't talked to in a long time. I just wanted him to know, no matter what we've gone through in this life, I love you. And we've had relationship and all this big stuff and now little unto me. What matters the most is that we become more like Jesus. I want to know him. I want our teenagers to know him. I want our kids to know him. I, I'm glad you know this book. I'm glad you can quote this book. But this book wants to be in you so bad. Amen. Thy word have I hid in my heart. To take this word and get to know him. And as you walk through resurrection times, God resurrected Cameron three weeks ago. I walk, we walked in that hospital room, and that young man was out. And we didn't know if he was going to make it. And Cameron, I looked at you, and I said, I bet you're dreaming of four-by-fours and pretty women. And that boy started grinning like a possum. Amen. He knows I'm talking about him right now. I've seen God resurrect. I understand his resurrection. When you get born again, not everybody knows you. They don't understand you. Give them some time. Connect with them. They may never know you. They may never get to know you. But with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, there's a presence in this house this morning. I don't say this every Sunday, but I'm going to say it this morning. Some of you have known a religious Jesus, but you've not have a, had a relationship with the Christ. He wants to come into your life. He wants to walk with you and talk with you. He wants you to know there ain't nothing you've ever done that will separate you from Him. And if you say, Pastor, I just want to get to know Him, and perhaps you've been away from Him, would you slip your right hand up the hand of receiving right now, if that's you, just put your right hand up. There you go, there you go, there you go, there you go. Amen. Just hold the right hand up. Now pray this with me, everybody in the house. Lord Jesus, I receive you. I thank you that this hand is a hand of blessing. Receiving. Amen. To be able to take from you and to give to others. I want to know you and the power of your resurrection. And perhaps even the fellowship of your sufferings in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you give God praise in this house? You just, you just think you know me. That's how, you know, you just think you know Jesus. Every time I think I know him, he does something far more wonderful to me. He shocks me. Amen. He amazes me. I'm blown away by him. Amen. Yes, he's the original outlaw. Yes, he's the savior of misfits. He's the Lord of the leftovers. Amen. I'm glad to be a leftover. Glory to God. Amen. If our servant leaders would come up, the preacher went a little long again. Amen. He'll go longer in the next service. Amen. He doesn't have no stipulations. I tell folk all the time, you want to get out of church early, come here. 
Amen. Because you know we, we bound to get out of here eventually. But we know we did. We moved other service up to 11 o'clock. It still says 1030, 1045, but they don't hush up. So we let them talk. Those, Frank, your, your garden group, man, coming out there. The gardens are looking good. I went by there yesterday, looked out. Man, look here. We, we grown some vegetables. We got some vegetables out there. Hallelujah. Tithe and offer envelopes in front of you. Many of you last week, like me, were unable to give. Do you know I was unable to give last Sunday because I was doing so many other things? So I wasn't able. So today I have to double my tithe to make sure I get it in. You never lose the tithe. You never quit tithing. Now, I, we had a man come here last week, gave a very large tithe. And somebody said, why is it so big? I said, because I hadn't seen him in a year. But he saved up for the whole year and gave his tithe. I honor that. God honors that. Amen. So be a giver today. Amen. Honor the king with your giving. As we give today, we're believing God for more money, less hours, benefits, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Y'all give Pastor Joseph a hand. <laughs>